Good morning, First Church family. It is so good to have you guys uh, join in for our service online. To uh, just even though you might not be able to be here in person, that uh, we are able to study God's word together and reflect on what it means for our lives. And so it is just an absolute um, blessing to be able to have this ministry in place. And so I'm uh, so thankful for that. We're going to be reading in Romans chapter 8 this morning. So if you in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, and we're going to, if you, if you don't know where Romans is, you can kind of open your Bible up uh, a little bit past the halfway point, and you should be somewhere in uh, one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And we're going to get to John, and we're going to flip past John a little ways, and it'll be in Acts, uh, and then you're going to go a little bit further than that, and we're going to get over on into Romans. And so once you get to Romans, you're going to look for that big uh, number eight, and that's where we're going to be reading at this morning. And the thing that I kind of want to talk about this morning is this idea of having something over-promised to us, and then whenever we get it, it's undelivered, uh, under-delivered, to, so to speak. And so what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of the times whenever the food industry is terrible about this, they'll, they'll put out a commercial of a, a new item on their menu and it looks so great and so amazing. I, I, the first thing that comes to mind is like a cheeseburger and, you know, the juice is just oozing out of it and it looks so good and the vegetables are fresh and the bun looks great and the cheese is just melted perfectly. And you think, man, that is, that is awesome. That looks so good. And you go in to uh, the restaurant and you order it or whatever the case may be or go through the drive-thru and you pull it out and you, you open up the sandwich bag and, and you look at it and it looks absolutely nothing like what it showed in the commercial. And so th this idea of over-promised and under-delivered or, or, or maybe it's, you know, something along the lines of uh, if you're a kid or, or maybe an adult even, uh, you have a birthday planned out and you know exactly what you wanted. You told everybody, this is what I want and thought that you were going to get it. And then you open up and you get so excited and you're like, yes, I'm going to get this awesome gift. And then you open it up and it's clothes. <laughs> you know, we, or unless you want clothes, of course. But there, there's this expectation for something the way that it should be. And then whenever we get it, we're not happy with, the, with what it was or, or how it turned out, whatever the case may be. And if we're not careful sometimes, our Christian life can be that just as easily. You know, we, we can get at this idea in our head that whenever we become a Christian and we are uh, following Jesus Christ, that everything else just kind of goes away. All of our problems, all of our um, past and everything that we've ever done, all of that just goes away and we have a new um, life in Christ. And while that is true, a lot of the times we don't live like that. We, we still hang on to our sin that, that we're struggling with. We still hang on to our past and the things that, that have come from our past. Maybe we hold on to the friends that we have. And so the problem with that is, is that Jesus can't take the change. Jesus can't, excuse me, Maybe things haven't changed the way that we thought that it should have because we haven't allowed Jesus to change us fully on the inside. And so we're, we're going to be kind of reading through Romans this morning. But before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for uh, this opportunity to be able to study your word, to be able to learn from it, to be able to reflect it in my own life. God, I am just so thankful for... Um, what you have to give us this morning. So God, I ask that you would open our ears and open our hearts this morning to your word that um, if there is, uh, hopefully that there is someone here this morning that is tuning in, that is watching this, that this is exactly what they need to hear this morning, God. God, we know that your word is powerful and that it convicts us and that it moves us and that it guides us into all things, into good things, because you have a plan for us. And so, God, I just ask that you would, as we study this word this morning, that you would just move in our hearts and our lives and that you would help us see exactly what we need to see this morning. God, we love you and we thank you for it's in your name we pray. Amen. 
And so we see here that uh, as, as we begin in, in chapter 8, that uh, before that, in Romans chapter 7, Paul starts talking a little bit about what life is like with Christ. And he, he, he gets really open with us, and he starts talking about the things, and he starts talking about his own sin. And he says, you know, that there are things that I do which I hate. And I don't know about you, but I've experienced that too. There's, there's certain things in my life that whenever I look back on it or in the midst of it, I'm thinking, why in the world am I doing this? This is not how I should be acting. This is not how I should be treating someone. This is not how I should be living my life, and yet I do it anyways. And that's exactly what Paul's saying. He says that I do the things that I don't want to do, and the things that I don't want to do, I do them anyways. And so there's this battle that's, that's, that's waging war between um, doing things of the flesh and, and, and doing things of the Spirit and following the Spirit or following the flesh. Whichever one we feed is the one that, that we most likely do. And so, uh, you know, Paul is frustrated with this. He's saying all of these things. And, and he says, wretched man, and this is in verse 24 of, of chapter 7. He says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we know from this scripture that the only way that we can be delivered from this sin, be taken away from the things that are holding us captive in our lives, is Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he gets into chapter 8, and that's where we're going to start actually reading this morning. And it says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you just let that kind of sink in for a second, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And you, and you may be wondering this morning, like, well, what, is, what does condemnation you know, really mean? Well, there's two different meanings behind it. One, there's this idea of a strong disapproval of, of whatever you're doing. That there is a... Um, that that son, somebody is condemning you because of something you're doing and that they disapprove of something that you're doing of the wrong that you that you have done and then there's this other side of it that uh it, it's it's also like a, a sentencing that someone condemns you to uh to a, a prison a prison or something along those lines a jury condemns um the accused for for the crimes that they committed and so that they are put in prison but this is, this is the most amazing part right here. This is why Paul writes this right after he says all of these things that he is struggling with and that he is dealing with. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That no matter what you've done in this life, no matter what you've done yesterday, the day before, the things that you have made mistakes at, the things that you have done, all of these things are forgiven. He says, I'm not going to accuse you of anything. I am not going to um, look down on you for anything because I have paid the price for your sins. We see this in, in the last series that we did, uh, the Born Again series, where this man, Nicodemus, comes to meet Jesus and, and he asks him, you know, Lord, what, what must I do to... Uh, Enter into the kingdom of heaven is basically what he says. He doesn't come right out and say it, but he has some questions and is seeking some answers from Jesus. And, and Jesus tells him, he says, if you want to be born again, you have to believe in Jesus Christ. You have to believe in me that, that God sent his only unique son to die on a cross for our sins. That he didn't do it to condemn the world, but to save the world. And, th and that's the beauty of, of this verse right here. And the whole beauty of, of chapter 8 in a whole is that Jesus Christ loves you and cares for you. And there is no condemnation in Him whatsoever. There is nothing that, that He disapproves of that, that you can't come back from by, by believing in, in His grace and His mercy and, and the price that He paid on the cross for, for our salvation. And so um, we, we read on a little bit further and it says, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. 
And so we see here that, that this idea during that time was that you had to do certain works and you had to follow the law, the Ten Commandments, and every law that stemmed off of it. There was hundreds of them. And you had to follow them to a T to earn your salvation. And that was the law of, of, of sin and death, so to speak. But Jesus, whenever Jesus came into the picture, there was this new law, this law of the Spirit, this law of grace and law of mercy that we recognize that we couldn't do it, on, do it on our own. And that's exactly what it says in verse 3. It says, for God has done what the law, remember the Old Testament law, weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. And so he, 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 we, whenever we read this scripture, we can recognize that, that we were never going to be able to do it. That even Paul talks about that while he was still living a life following Christ, that he still struggled with certain things in his life. That he still did things that was sinful and that he knew that he shouldn't be doing and he, and he did them anyways. But that's the beauty of, of what uh, th- this whole chapter is all about is because it's saying that there is no condemnation. There is no disproval of, of, of what you have done and, and what your past is like because Christ Jesus has made a way possible for us to be righteous through Him. That whenever we believe in Him and His saving work and, and what He did on the cross and Him raising from the dead, that, that we have a new life in Christ, that we have this life in the Spirit. And so we, 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 whenever we realize those things, then that's whenever we start realizing that we are living like we are loved. But a lot of the times we have this problem with with living like we're loved. And that's kind of the theme for uh, today is is living like you're loved. We have this problem with thinking, well, no one cares about me. That I I don't deserve God's love. I I don't, I don't, understand why these bad things are still happening to me despite me uh, making a commitment to Christ and, and, and following Him. There, there's so many different things here that, that we can um, say that we live by our feelings more than what we live by the truth of things. And the truth this morning is God loves us so much that, that he, he cares for us and, and He wants us to have a relationship with Him. And so He did everything possible the things that we couldn't do to allow us to, to have that love. But this is the part that gets us every time, is that a lot of the times, even though we know these things to be true, we're not living like they're true. Because once we read down into verse 4, it says, "...in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit." And in verse 1, some of your Bibles might have read that same thing. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And they they took that out, actually, because in some manuscripts it didn't have it. But it doesn't matter because in verse 4, it tells us the same exact thing. And so the the, the point that that I want to get us across this morning is that the reason maybe that uh, we're not... Or, or the thing that we need to live like we're loved at is we need to start walking like we're loved. And you, you might ask the question, well, Luke, what are, you, what are you talking about, walking like you're loved? Well, in those times, that, that was one of the most important parts of life, is you had to walk from work to, to home, where you were going to go, whether it was extracurricular or not. And, and we do the same things today in our daily commute. Um, instead of vehicles and... Uh, buses and planes and all of those different things to take us back and forth, they had to walk wherever they went or had to ride an animal of some sort to walk wherever they had to go. And so that took up a lot of time and effort in their day. And so Jesus is saying, or or Paul is saying here in Romans, that those who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And so if we were to kind of boil it all down... This idea of walking like you're loved, it's basically living your life like you're loved. To not, you know, whenever you go to work and and you you are talking to people and you are uh, seeing them and communicating with them and socializing, that you're not focused on these things of the world and things that that is going to cause us to bring us down. 
but you're focusing on the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. In Romans 8.18, it, it talks about this. It says, For I consider the, that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. You know, a lot of times, whenever something bad happens, we forget all of the things that have happened good in our lives. 2020 was supposed to be this great year of um, uh, in a new life, new changes, you know, all of these things. It was a new decade, right? And uh, for, for me personally and, and for our church, like, and, and for probably most of you, it's, it's been kind of hard. You know, we've had to navigate through some uncharted territory in life and, and had to um, try and figure things out and how we do certain things because of this pandemic that has been laying waste to our country and, and, it, and nationally and internationally. And trying to, you know, figure out, well, you know, how do I do work? How do I... Um, get my kids to, um, you know, a babysitter or something while I go to work. There's just been so many things, and, and it's consumed our lives. Like, we've allowed that to be the, the main thing that we talk about. But in, in, in chapter 8 right here, it says that, that if there is no condemnation, that if Christ has truly set us free from these things, then why aren't we living life like that? Why aren't we sharing? Like That is the greatest thing that could have ever happened to us in this life and the life to come, and we just act like it's nothing. We act like it's something that is just, well, yeah, John 3, 16, God so loved the world, gave His only begotten Son. Whoever should believe in Him shouldn't perish, but you know, have everlasting life. Like, no, we need to be excited about this. We need to be walking down the street and saying, this is the greatest thing that has ever happened to me, and I want you to know this, and I want you to experience this, because it is so important. But we're so wrapped up in, in the things of this world. We get more excited about turkey season and, and, and hunting season and, and our hobbies and our interests, and we want to talk about those things and, and how important those things are in our lives, but we forget about the love that Christ has shown us, the love that God has shown us by sending His Son to die on a cross for our sins, that He conquered sin and death and, and, and was raised from the dead on the third day and, and that He is living with the Father and that we, it, it, by following Him in these steps of, of, of believing in Him, that we have that same, same thing for us, that He is. He, he is delivered what he has promised but i think a lot of the times we don't do that we 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 have a problem that we don't live like we're loved sometimes and so we we move on to verse five and it says for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on things of the spirit and so if we're going to live like we're loved, we're going we're gonna to have to walk like we're loved. And the times that we are you know, communicating with others and, and talking about things, then there needs to be a certain change inside of us where like, that news, uh, that great news of what Jesus has done, like, that needs to be filling our life and that needs to be displayed throughout our life. Like, whenever we recognize that, there needs to be something that changes inside of us. There needs to be something that is is just cannot fathom and cannot realize just the overall joy of what that means for us. And so we get into verse 5 and it talks about these things and it says, setting your mind. And so this, this, the second thing that we need to do if we're going to live like we're loved and live the way that we should based off of this knowledge of what Jesus Christ has done in our life, we need to know like we're loved. And I don't want you to think, well, that, that doesn't sound gr grammatically correct, Luke. But it, <laughs> you should have said think like you're loved, right? And no, I don't, want, I don't want you to have that word in your mind because think is like, well, I think that's true. Well, I, I, I think Jesus did that stuff for me. But you need to know in your heart and in your mind that that, that is exactly what God promised and that is exactly what God delivered. To set your mind doesn't mean to just think, but it means to know. And so we, 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 we look at this and we say, well, what does is, what is setting your mind on the flesh look like? Well, I think it kind of looks like focusing on things of this world. 
that we, you know, worry about how the world thinks of us, what the world says we are, what the world is, what's going on in the world and what's happening in the world. And if I lose my job, then, then my life is, is over. If, if me and uh, something happens to my family, then my life is over. If something is, you know, a great pandemic sweeps over the nation, my life is over. But Christ tells us that, or, or Paul tells us in Romans that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That whenever we recognize what that truly means, that we have eternal life outside of this life. That it doesn't end. Whenever we follow Christ in, in death, that we also followed Him whenever He was raised from the dead. And that we have a hope after this life. It's just so amazing to me whenever you fully start reading into these things and really like dwelling on them and looking at them and saying, wow, God is so good. And everything that I thought was bad and negative and everything that has happened to me or happened to my friends or happened to my family or people that I know, like it does not matter compared to what I have in glory in Christ. Going back to that Romans 8.18. It's nothing worth comparing to for the glory that is to be revealed to us. And so we, we see here that whenever we set our mind on the Spirit, we concentrate on the things that are greater than the things that are negative in our life. We, we focus on having a relationship with the Creator of the universe. We focus on the things that we have a helper and a guide. We're not alone in this life. That no matter how many people turn away from us and don't like us and, and call us goofy or, or crazy for believing in this certain thing, that we have a helper that is the Spirit of God that is leading and directing us in our lives. That we have been set free from sin. That, that we don't have to worry about the things of our past that even though other people might bring it up, God has completely forgotten it. It is amazing what happens whenever we can start concentrating on these things, on the positive things that we have in Christ instead of the negative things that are of this world? And so we, we, we get into um, verse 6, and it says, For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. You know, at the, at the end of this verse, I was, I was trying to figure out, you know, how to wrap this up, what verse to end at, and I, and I couldn't figure it out. I didn't know if we read it all the way down to, to 11 or, you know, if, if we were going to just kind of hit the whole chapter because it's so good. But I think that, that stopping at this verse is, is so important to really reflect on because basically Paul's saying, you know, you have to, there's a choice right here. You either set your mind... On the, on, on the flesh, which results in death, or you set your life, or set in your mind on the Spirit, which is life and peace. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems like a pretty easy answer to me. A pretty easy choice to make. I much rather would have life and peace over, over flesh and death. It, it, it doesn't even compare. But the problem is, is that sometimes we're not living like like God loves us. We're not walking and being joyful for the things that God has blessed us with and the things that, that He has, has gifted us in this life and the life to come. We get so wrapped up in all of these other things that are happening in this world and we forget the, the, the greatest thing that could have ever happened to us in this life. And that's having a relationship with Him. You know, going back to what Paul had said about counting these things, you know, consider these sufferings um, of the present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be, to re that is to be revealed to us. And, and it's amazing, if you look in, uh, I, I believe it's 2 Corinthians chapter 11, there is a list that Paul actually lays out of the... Tw 21 years in his 32 year ministry of all of the things that he has suffered for Christ. He's been beaten by rods and, 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 and whipped with lashes like up to like 39 times, like five different times. 
He's been lost at sea. He's, he's went to bed hungry and he's been in danger of robbers and, and the seas and, 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 and just all of these sorts of perils in his life. And you know what he says? He says, the, the thing that keeps me up at night, this is kind of my paraphrased version, is the fact of all of these other churches. He was worried that people weren't going to realize what Jesus Christ had done for them. And I think this morning that if you don't understand what Jesus Christ has done for you, you're missing out on, on, on such an amazing life, something that's going to outweigh all of the negative things in your life. And so uh, as, as we close this morning, and uh, I just, I just want to ask you the question, is are you living your life like you are loved by Jesus Christ? Maybe you didn't know it this morning. Um, maybe you didn't, you didn't think anybody cared. I'm going to tell you this morning that Jesus cares for you. That he, he loves you so much. That for God so loved the world, going back to John 3.16, because it's just so good, that He sent His only unique Son, His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. All it takes... Is belief in Him. But whenever we believe something, it changes us from the inside out. It, 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 it allows us to live our days in this life joyful and, and encouraged and where nothing can bring us down. And a lot of the times, we, we don't live like that. I don't live like that always. But we should. Because it is just a, so amazing to know the things that, that, that Christ has done for us in our life. And so, as, and just to kind of, you know, re-hit on that, Romans 8, 35 through 39 says this, that who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Guys, this morning it's, it, it comes down to just a simple choice. Either believing that Jesus Christ is who He says He is and recognizing all of the things that He has done here on this earth and outside of, of being here on this earth, that He is sending His Spirit right now to tell you and to guide you into having a relationship with Him. Nothing can separate us from that kind of love. We can deny it, but we, we can't just... It doesn't, it doesn't mean that it separates um, from us. And so I just ask this morning that if any of you are, are, are thinking about making that commitment, that you would get with us, that, that you would talk to us about these things, and that you would um, start living life like you are loved above everything else. Let's go to heaven in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, just your word and the things that it reveals to us. We thank you for this time spent just being able to study it and reflect on it. And recognize how loved we are, dear Heavenly Father. To recognizing that despite all of these things that have happened in our lives, the negative side of things, that God, the, the most important thing in this world that we have to cling to is what Jesus Christ's um, sacrifice means to us. That all we have to do to, to receive a gift of salvation is, is, is just receive it. To believe that it's true, to believe that Jesus Christ is who He says He is, and that our life will be completely changed from that moment on. God, I thank You for this, this wonderful opportunity to be able to preach Your Word and uh, to share it with others. And God, if, if somebody here this morning maybe has been living uh, a life for You, but they have forgot to live like they are loved, and that You love them so much, then God, I just ask that, that they would make the decision today to say, I'm going to start living like that. That I don't have to feel like 
so negative and, and feel like everything is, is against me and whenever something bad happens that it's the end of the world because we know that it's not. We know that, that we have a hope in You. And so God, I just thank You for this opportunity. I thank You for the ones that are tuning in watching. I just ask that You would bless them and uh, watch over them in their lives. These things I ask in Your name. Amen. Guys, thank you for tuning in this morning. Uh, if, if any of you have any questions or uh, want to get with us about uh, what we talked about this morning or uh, what a relationship with Christ looks like in your life, we just ask that you would contact us uh, via Facebook or uh, phone or text, just whatever. Guys, I love you so much and uh, thank you for tuning in. <laughs>